So let's go ahead and welcome everyone aboard. Um, again, happy Friday to everyone. Um, I think you will enjoy what we have planned today. Um, we are learning about um, strategies that have to do with developing life skills for elementary school students and ourselves actually. I found that a lot of the information that I'm going over is very pertinent to adults as well. So I'm learning by my own um, learning and teaching and resources and taking it to heart as well. So as we move along, we are going through these elements of developing life skills. We've concentrated on developing a strategy and ways to listen. Today, we're going to focus on exhibiting self-control and coping skills. So um, I think that this is something that we can really benefit from in the classroom. And we're gonna go on this journey today. Um, we have um, some very in interesting information that I want to share with you with um, some programs that are being implemented throughout um, Title I schools throughout the nation. And of course, we all know with Title I schools, they do cater to certain programming to meet certain needs for inner city students and those students that might be in rural areas. So I thought that this might be really befitting for what um, we're going through within your culture in the Navajo Nation. So I'm really excited about putting these key elements together that will really help, I believe, benefit you in the classroom as well as your students. So if you have something to write with, I wanna just quickly go through what we'll be working on today. As you see, it's a pretty um, hefty list of things that we will go over as we venture into developing these engagement skills and coping still skills. So um, yeah, I'm quite excited about bringing this to, um, to, our, to our professional development and um, understanding that over this past year, we've all had to learn ways of, to cope and to self-manage. And um, here's a list of the things that we will be working with. Um, we'll learn about engagement strategies, being aware of stress, identifying chronic stress, looking at signs of engagement and when there are no signs of engagement for our students. We're gonna go over this, um, this concept of what we call um, CHAMP. You'll find more about, out about that in a moment. Um, we're gonna go over to discussing reading skills and developing um, activities in um, with reading and coping skills, developing feedback, movement, adding movement into the classroom, working memory, developing that, um, building new activities that are will be um, something that you can implement ongoing, recognizing the different challenges, developing and adding rigor into the lesson and lesson planning using, um, whoops, <laughs> thematic, using this thematic teaching process and developing um, this way of this buy-in for students um, where they will need a buy-in to see that, um, yeah, can I trust this? Is it something we're good to go with? Um, the elements of gaming and then also the element of, can we change our brain into learning new ways of um, breaking bad habits? Um, also, we're going to talk about these a ver variety of engagement strategies, connecting and um, learning um, within the real world, engaging with their students' interests, filling in that dead time that sometimes takes place in the classroom, how to use and work with um, as collaborators, engage students. Um, to present and share their work regularly so they are ready and always available to do that. Um, give your students a say in developing certain things that they want to engage in and develop and learn. Get your students moving and learning to really read that room. Um, next, we're going to talk about being aware of stress 
And um, some of those ways of identifying, these don't only go with just in the classroom, but engaging in strategies to uh, manage the classroom, things to be aware of, um, physical surroundings, um, making sure that we can reduce the clutter and distraction in the classroom. We find that that is something that, um, you know, I think we're all used to having this multi-purpose classroom, but sometimes it can be a distraction. So we need to know what is appropriate for that. Also, making sure that we're posting the daily activities and the routines that are going on so students know what to expect. Also, give students a break, um, give, um, to break into new process, give them that time to adjust. Um, learning ways to promote and maintain a positive learning environment and learning to communicate and to talk about the situation. So we talk about this chronic stress. We don't always see this. It's not always identified. Um, that's something that's obvious, but certain things that do give indication of possible chronic stressors have to do with, you know, sometimes a student might show up a little bit more irritable than they might normally be. And so that could be a sign that they're going through some of the stressors, headaches, um, difficulty concentrating, remembering um, their thoughts and being a little disorganized also could be a way of um, students um, showing stress. I know for me that that does happen sometimes when I am not, I like to be organized, but sometimes my thoughts, if they're not, um, it could be a sign of stress. Difficulty sleeping. Oftentimes we don't know whether or not our students are, um, what, the, what the life is at home. Um, we don't know what that really looks like after we, um, after they leave the classroom. So um, these are some of the signs. Um, eating problems, um, stomach aches, dis digestive um, problems and or change of appetite. Then we often look at, um, we talk about this engagement, but what about when there's no engagement? We wanna be aware of that and this sense of apathy that might take place, students showing that they're just bored and loss of interests. These are also signs of, um, they, they might need some areas to self-manage and to cope and learn some coping skills. So as I talked about this acronym of CHAMP, this has to do with bringing this into the classroom. Conversation for the C, um, help for that H, active and activities for the A, movement and motion, and I can even add one more, motivation for that um, or that M in um, champ, and then finally participation. So um, when you see this, that is what that um, basically represents. So um, we know also that reading is, um, is a staple in the classroom. So we have to make sure that we are involving um, building vocabulary, making sure that our students are understanding the definitions of the words and learning how to use them properly, and then giving this uh, back to our students so they can develop these particular skills, asking questions, as well. So um, it says here in this bit of research, simply by opening a book, you allow yourself to be invited into the literally literal uh, world that um, can distract us. Um, of course, you know, we can bring ourselves back into calming ourselves back down by reading a good book. It can relax us. And it also, it says, um, through research says that it can really lower your heart rate and um, it re can reduce stress up to about 68%. So that's something good to know for students and adults. Feedback is the other area that we need to focus on. And um, based on this research, we find that um, although stress, stress has no effect on general acquisition of um, the task. Results indicate that participants use negative feedback significantly less during learning after stress 
compared with the control con, um, condition. So we want to make sure that we're learning ways to um, enhance our efforts um, and um, enhancing the effect of stress on the use of using this positive feedback. Um, research shows that for every three positive um, there's, or, or vice versa, if there's one negative comment, we need to reinforce that with three positive um, forms of feedback. And so I, I find it very interesting how the negativity um, runs rampant. They're hearing negativity at home, in the community often, through the news, et cetera. So in the classroom, we want to use inferences and um, expressions and really focus on bringing positive aspects um, and reinforcing what students need to cope with stress. We're using movement in, in the classroom, of course, we know how important it is when students need to get up and wiggle and move, et cetera, and these physical activities. We are using this ongoing to develop um, these different strategies. And so we need to make sure we're using movement, games, and various styles of learning techniques into the classroom. And then we're gonna also take a look at um, focusing on reflection, making sure that after all the things that students are doing during the day in their classroom, that there's a time of a, like a wind down time, a time of reflection that is very paramount as far as um, 21st century learning. We have to give our students a voice so we can know kind of what's going on, what they've learned, and going back to teaching them responsibility, planning, and um, also um, listening skills. Um, we're going to learn to do this through different games. Um, there's going to be three different simple learning games. You're probably pretty familiar with them, but um, we will go over those, the number game, the rhythm game, sen the sentence game. Also talking about um, thematic teaching is so important, making sure that we're putting these themes together that might correlate back to what we're reading and being able to use this style of teaching through throughout the day or throughout the week um, in reflecting up on a theme. Also using relationship building as a strategy it, as to find ways to cope um, for our students um, to get their buy-in, you know, that buy-in, once they trust us as educators and they feel a little bit more comfortable in what we're introducing to them, that's the buy-in that they need. We also are gonna talk about self-pacing students and allowing students to set some goals for themselves as we learned about the, um, um, the do and review and planning. We wanna make sure that students are planning their success. Additionally, building attitudes, um, positive attitudes. There's you know, various ways that we can do this through coping and um, different ways of developing coping skills that um, we'll be utilizing. Um, recognizing these challenges that students are going through. I love this particular aspect. What does what we say to our students look like? That is amazing to me because if we put ourselves in the role of the student when we're giving instruction, asking them to um, imagine, we need to make sure that we're using words and verbiage and mindsets that puts that into the aspect of asking that question. What is it that what we say to our students, what does that look like to them? So it's kind of like putting us, putting ourselves in their shoes. And then um, adding rigor is so important. Being able to add that rigor um, that includes giving a core understanding to the student in, as far as instructions, maybe saying it, showing it, writing it, in ways of um, making sure that in the diversification in the classroom, that all students are able to have their learning 
method met, you know, making sure that they're understanding the way that they understand best. Collaboration, um, authentic role playing, making sure that um, that is an element that we're using that also brings rigor. Um, inference is so important to use in the classroom, using whatever evidence that they have to have them to make that correlation as to what they are thinking about what they're learning and how they're learning and how to express themselves. And then also observation to um, find this new deeper way of understanding. And then of course, the thematic teaching, you know, coming up with um, different themes, um, whether it's based on the story that you are working on or historical fact that you want to use as the theme, whether it's for the week, whether it's for the month, and uh, making sure that they are thoroughly learning about that particular theme. So one, choosing that theme, doing the research, having the students do some research, and then um, design an essential question relevant to that particular theme. And so this is a great learning process that you'll be able to use. We talked about buy-in. That's where we talk about um, building relationships with our students. Again, the gaming, those particular areas. And then finally, is it possible to change the way we think? We, we know as learning, as we're learning, students, they're, they're expanding their knowledge. But what about habits? What about behavior? Um, we need to develop ways of helping to change and expand our brain activity in um, the responsiveness to questions and lessons, um, making sure that we are building relationships and camaraderie, setting goals where the student is doing the goal setting as well as the student as partnership, and then learning from experience. So that's quite a bit of what we'll be going through with um, in today's session and um, I'm moving backwards, sorry for, for this, but that was the simplest way. So now um, sit back, I have this wonderful, fun, wonderful bit of information that I think that um, you will really enjoy some of the concepts, all of the aspects of learning and finding ways that um, different school districts are using their best practices in order to bring this wonderful learning opportunity in the classroom for our students. So let's take a look and get going on this. Poverty is not just a problem for the poor, it affects everyone. The number of school-aged children in poverty has jumped from 16 to 22 percent in the last eight years. The number of poor that graduate from high school is barely 50 percent nationwide, compared to nearly 90 percent of the non-poor. The current unemployment rate for high school dropouts is over 50 percent greater than that for high school completers. Every year, over a million students drop out, costing the government almost a fifth of a trillion dollars over a lifetime. With a shrinking middle class, poverty is growing the underemployment rate and it's economically unsustainable. The problem is critical and if unchecked, will lead to dramatic changes in our lifestyle. But you can help solve the problem and ensure that every student graduates job or college ready. They don't teach you these things when you learn how to become a teacher. Through years of study, learning expert and author Eric Jensen has found that engagement is a key factor in the academic success of economically disadvantaged students. He travels the country working with teachers and schools to help them learn strategies for engaging with their students. At a conference in Albuquerque, New Mexico, Eric and a group of Title I teachers talk about their experiences. You can't just take kids that are here and say, okay, this is because getting the staff to buy into it. You know, it's a huge issue. One of the problems with the students is that they just don't know how to do school. They don't, they haven't been taught. You know, they don't go home and talk to their families about what they did during that day. 
And I think the engagement part that we're learning about is important. It really is key in building those relationships with those students. You simply can't lower expectations for these kids. You actually have to raise it and you have to make it as difficult as possible so that they understand that they're working hard for something and they put the effort into being successful. And you can't I had a really crazy upbringing. You know, I mentioned my first memory in life was being two years old and just having my mom walk out and, you know, I'm just a basket case full of tears. And that was just the start of it. Everything just went downhill from there. Uh, you know, I went through stepmother after stepmother and the first one I had was really abusive and violent. And, you know, when I was at school, I just noticed that I was different than other kids at school. It seemed like I was the one that always wanted to sit in the back of the class and I wasn't connecting a lot with what was going on in the classroom. But a couple times something happened that just a light went on for me. And when I think back on it, it was always teachers that connected with me and always teachers that engaged me. And so once I got interested in all of this brain science, you know, neuroscience just like, it was like this big light goes on in my brain. I started piecing the puzzle together and go, wow, this is what's going on with kids who grow up in poverty. Their brain's different. Their brain's different. And the question is like, what makes it different? And also, what do you do about it? And I realized that what works is creating the connections that many kids didn't have because that's what worked for me. And what works is getting kids into the process because the way many kids are is they disconnect from the process. They just say, I don't wanna play the game or they'll be angry because they've had adults pretty much rip them off, you know. They leave them in their life somehow. And so the question then is, what do we do about it? How do we help them? And so I've found that it really resonated with teachers, administrators to say, engaging kids from poverty is really the ticket. And you engage with relationships, you engage with what you do in class, and it's really made a profound difference in many schools. Teachers are the biggest difference makers. We're visiting two Title I elementary schools where teachers are doing just that, using Eric Jensen's engagement strategies to make a difference in the lives of their students. Georgetown East Elementary, a Title I school located in Annapolis, Maryland. They've been using Eric Jensen's engagement strategies for the last year on a school-wide basis. We have two questions as we reflect. What are your ahas or something that made you think? And it can be today or in the book study or just as you're going through your year and we've been in professional development. And then, or what are your next steps to build your teaching capacity? Georgetown East teachers participate in regular professional development based on engaging students with poverty in mind, sharing both the successes and challenges they've experienced using the book strategies to meet the needs of their students. What our goal is. Our challenges are pretty similar to most of the schools that are in the Title I. We have the highest percentage of free and reduced lunch in our county, which is upwards of about 87% of our population. Some of the challenges they face are challenges that you would see in a bigger, more urban setting, uh, bigger cities. You know, they come from neighborhoods where dr drugs are a problem, where violence is a problem, where, where crime just in general is a problem. They come from homes where there are, we have the working poor, where we have parents who are working multiple jobs to provide for their families, and sometimes the children are left with another caregiver or sometimes by themselves. Children living under these conditions experience chronic stress which affects them in a number of ways. They show up at school, you'll see cognitive skills are impaired. They don't remember things as well. They don't process things quickly. And because of that, teachers will make judgments like, well, the kid's not maybe cut out for advanced curriculum. Another way chronic stress impacts kids is through behavior issues. Kids tend to act out a lot because one impact of chronic stress in the human brain is that we create coping strategies. And the coping strategy is either going to be, I'm gonna become more hypervigilant to help manage stress and get in your face, 
or I'm going to be the kid that just pulls the plug and I disconnect. When kids are not engaged, they drift off into what you and I would call counterproductive states, metabolic states. For example, apathy or boredom, or I have gotten interested in something else. So engagement keeps the metabolic process going. It's not just the blood flow, but it's keeping the direction, keeping the focus, and it keeps kids cognitively involved. At Georgetown East, engagement starts before students even get inside the building. When students come to our school in the mornings, as they're walking down the driveway or when they get off the bus, they see caring adults everywhere. So we want to make sure that they feel safe. They feel safe from a physical standpoint, but also from a mental standpoint. We teach our kids the culture that we want to see. So we walk in, we're shaking their hands, we're smiling, we're to, you know, really excited to see them before they leave. You know, we say, I can't wait to see you tomorrow. It's going to be awesome. Or if they're upset, letting them talk through being upset, but that's still not an opportunity to not learn. Do you know that word motivates? I put a hard word in there. Fourth grade teacher Michelle Ballinger uses a number of techniques to engage her students and build positive relationships. Ba -da -ba -ba -ba. Okay, boys and girls, we're going to start our morning meeting now that we're back from chorus. Michelle eases into morning reading groups with a couple of relationship building exercises. These daily rituals are an important part of their routine. I say to them often, we're here to learn, we're having fun, but it's not a joke. So I try to just make it as fun as, as I can for, for the work that needs to get done. A very important part of our classroom climate is starting the day with the morning meeting. If I try to skip it, the day doesn't go as smoothly. My name is Ms. Ballinger, yeah. and I like to teach. Yeah. And I'll be a teacher yeah. every day of my life. Every day of my life. My name is Avery. Yeah. yeah. I like to navigate. Yeah. yeah. And I'll be a navigator. Yeah. yeah. Every day in my life. Every, Every day, day of his life. I wholeheartedly believe that it is the way we start to build relationships. It gives me a chance to judge everyone's mood for the day, yeah. how yeah. silly we are, yeah. how sleepy we are. My name is Brandon. Yeah. I'll be a basketball player slash football player. Yeah. I'll be a basketball star, football star. Yeah. Every day of my life. Every day of his life. My name is Raylan. Yeah. I like to dance. Yeah. yeah. I'll be a dancer. Yeah. yeah. Every day of my life. Every day of my life. Then we move into the sharing, and that just gives them a chance to just talk to each other. I think a lot of times our school day is just so fast paced, it lets them kind of get to know each other. And in the same vein, it um, they're practicing listening skills. Okay, boys and girls, next up is our reading groups. Remember, our goal during reading groups is always to develop reading fluency, accuracy, and comprehension. To build high expectations in this classroom, we have a few sort of pillars. Um, something that's always evident is a CHAMPS chart. The C in CHAMPS stands for conversation level, and we have a dial that will turn to the appropriate conversation level. The H stands for help. How, how do I get help in this situation? The activity is always defined as individual, small group, whole group, partner work. The M in CHAMP stands for movement or motion. Where can they be? How should they be moving? Can they go to the bathroom or sharpen a pencil at that time? And then the P is for participation. And in here, we always say that looks like safe, respectful, responsible, and ready. Those are our school rules. And so for every center that they go to, that's defined. And those are the expectations. So it makes it very clear cut. Okay, so as we move to our first reading choice, you need to choose one action from column one, a way to do it in column two, and another description from column three. You have one minute. If you're coming to me, you need your normal notebook, pencil, chair, and storybook. Go. Students rotate through centers. In this center, they have the opportunity to work independently in pairs. So what's your book about? Oh, uh, well, the second chapter was about this man, this um, this guy named Brett, Bren Brendan Clark. Um, he 
He um he was the one of the best football players and then like the higher ranks like near college, high school. Um, At another center, Michelle works with a small group and coaches them on their specific reading strengths and weaknesses. Elaji point to Deshauna, Deshauna point to Elaji, Breland point to Avery, Avery point to Breland. You guys are a little okay, out of so it, so I want you to say, I want you. I want, I want you. you to be ready for learning. To be ready, ready for learning. learning. Okay. I will use Simon Says, or they'll look at each other and say, I want you to be ready for learning, like Uncle Sam. <laughs> um, when I'm seeing that someone's a bit unfocused or distracted or sleepy, just to refocus them on what our purpose is. The gist for today is read to find out what happens when Dexter meets his victim. He's, he, in the last part, he found his victim, right? But now he's actually going to meet and talk to him. Right, OK? There's going to be two words in the chapter that I wanted to make sure we knew. This word, obediently. Have you heard that word before? Yeah. I heard obedient. Yeah, obedient. And what, what does it mean if you're obedient? I bet, okay, having to do with honesty, Deshauna? Um, you do what's told to do. You do what you're told? Are you well behaved? So well behaved. What happens to a word when we add L-Y? Um, it, it turns into a... It turns into something. Good, Deshauna looked right at the board and she saw that the adverbs end in L-Y. So it's turned into an adverb. So I want you to read out loud to me. Hey, Duckler said from behind, a boy jumped a little like he was surprised. He turned around and saw Dexter, and his face scrunched up in, in fear. He started to scramble to his feet like he wanted to run away. Avery, why do you think this person wanted to run away from Dexter? Because, because remember, he punched him. Oh, he punched him. So how is he feeling if he got punched by Dexter? Scared that he's, he's going to get punched again. Good, good inference. Avery, why is, why is the word Robin in italics? Do you remember why this author was using italics? On one of the pages, it looked like this because uh, he's, he was wondering about something. In his own head? Yeah. You're doing a great job with that, yeah? In his own head. Okay, okay finish off this page and then I'm going to He's so give distracted. You You're doing a great job. Uh, okay. Kids need a lot of feedback. When teachers were surveyed and asked how often do you give kids feedback, the number that they gave was more than twice as much as what the kids actually said. So kids are starved for feedback. You know what you did? Why? Michelle uses specific feedback that relates directly to both the learning goals and the progress that's been made. Okay, Avery, can I tell you something that you did really great at? Yeah. That you've gotten really good at since the last time I heard you read? You were reading with really good expression and you were really focused. You were really focused, and I know that's something you were, you've been working on lately. Do you know what else you've done a good job on? Making inferences. During transitions, Michelle uses a quick energizer to elevate focus and boost energy. Okay, freeze like a caveman in a glacier. We're getting ready to transition. While I walk over to reset the timer, you need to do 10 toe touches and then face someone near you and tell them one cool thing you read, wrote, or spelled in the last 18 minutes. Um, I read a book. Look, something interesting is that his name was Robin, and that was interesting that he thought that that his, his parents were mean and nasty. Are we comparing And that he said they um, aren't you supposed to be flying to winter because he's, his name is Robin, like a bird. It's a Z. You need another Since we've started working with the book, I feel like the climate is a lot more fun. It's fun to be engaged in your learning. And I think teachers feel more comfortable now that we've read something professional that says it's okay to do these things that might not look like the way we grew up learning or it might not look like someone sitting at their desk and 
working hard and very serious all day long. It looks fun, and I think we've caught the kids in that, and, and they want to be here. They want to be learning. back to letting go of control and not being afraid of the lesson not going exactly like you want it to go. If you're giving them choice in what they're writing about, they might need a lot more guidance from you and how to approach that. We found that. Like Michelle, kindergarten teacher Amanda Fields uses a number of activities to engage her students, incorporating movement, games, and music. What does five things ready for learning look like? Look at the person next to you. If they're sitting five things ready for learning, give them a high five. Do you need someone? Say, Jonathan. She starts every morning session with calendar time. We use this to practice listening and speaking skills. We also incorporate a lot of math activities during this as we practice counting when the kids are counting the days of the month. We try to incorporate a lot of active learning during this time. We give them the opportunity to stand up, make a circle, pass around a ball to really engage their whole body. Okay, hands on your shoulders. Okay, I'm looking at the calendar and I think that I need a helper to help me fix our calendar. It says today is Monday, but today is not Monday. Yesterday was Monday. Yesterday was Monday. What is today? Tuesday. Can you please come find it? Write the letter in the air. What does Tuesday begin with? Sean, what does Tuesday begin with? T. Which letter? T. That's the sound. What's the name of the letter? T. T. Everyone say, today is Tuesday. Today is Tuesday. She even knew tomorrow was going to be Wednesday. Can you give her a clap? Great job. Erin, what number are we turning over? Uh, 29. Today is Tuesday, April 29, 2014. Sean, excellent. We have one more. What number is going to come after 29? If you know, put your hands on your head. What number is going to come after 29? If you know, put your hands on your head. Should we figure it out? Can you stand up and make a circle? 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Drop hands. All right, let's start counting and see if we can get all the way to the number that comes after 29. Justin, can you grab the small white bear, please? Justin, you're going to start with 1 past the bear, and let's see if we can get to the number after 29. Go ahead. One. It's important to keep the kids engaged through physical activity, which is the reason why throughout my day our students are dancing, they're manipulating objects like a ball. During different times of the day, they're manipulating letters or words in order to get that kinesthetic connection to the activity. Put them on your shoulder and say, I am. I think the first thing when creating a positive culture is having a smile. And our kids are great about supporting one another in all the different academic tasks. We constantly are cheering for one another. We vary the different cheers. They get excited about using the cheers themselves. They love to choose the cheer we're going to do, whether it's a firework cheer or the camera looking good cheer or just a clap. Uh-oh. What comes after 29? 30. Give them a firework cheer. Good job, Jonathan. 30. So what day was I have tomorrow? set high expectations since the moment my children set foot in this classroom. I tell them the end of our year goal. I let them know what first graders are able to do. We do the bigger kid challenge just to make it more of a game when setting these expectations. Now here's that tough question, remember. You're really good at this. This is something you have to know by the end of the year, something that first graders do, but we can do it now, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we have five straws. How many straws do we have? Five. Five. How many more until we have another 10? All right, look at your 10 fingers, everybody. Quidier, do you see them? We have five. What should I do if I have five? What should I do with my hand? Go to Leah. Can everybody put it into a fist? How many more until we have another 10? 
Five. I love that quiet hand. Davion? Five. Good. We have five days until another ten. Can you give Davion a clap? Hello, neighbor. What do you say? I try as best I can to plan engaging lessons in order to motivate my students and keep them working hard every day throughout the entire school day. It's a long day already for a five to six year old. So planning lessons that get their body moving, that are fun to them, and that are at that just right level of not too hard and not too easy. What do you say? If you can hear my voice clap once, if you can hear my voice clap. Turn and face the person next to you. Shake their hand. Drop your hands. Tell that partner the three body parts that an insect has. Thorax, abdomen. Okay, one more time. Head, thorax, abdomen. Face me. You're going to need to remember this poem for our poetry center, right? Yeah. So let's make sure we remember how it goes. Can you sing the first three words with me? Head, thorax, abdomen, abdomen. Head, thorax, abdomen, abdomen. Eyes and mouth and antenna. Two, six legs, and there's an insect for you. All right, one more time. I try to create a good classroom where students feel happy and want to have fun, so we do that through games and through song and dance. I want my children to know that I appreciate their efforts. Four. Yeah, way to go. You did a super job. All right, we're going to play turtle. And the turtle is a game of the working memory, so you have to remember the rules. The only one from left to right is able to tell you the answer. Fifth grade teacher, Cindy Payne, teaches math during her morning session. She uses a multi-step process to ease her students into the learning. First, a low-risk working memory math game meant to push her students' sluggish mind and body states into more active states. Ready? Yellow is four, the multiples of four. Four. Hmm? Yellow is four, the multiples of four. Four, eight. Yellow is four, multiple of four. Four, eight, twelve. Yellow is four, and the multiple of four. Four, eight, twelve. 16. Orange is the multiple of 2, 2. 4 is the multiple of 4, 4, 8, 12, 16, 20. Orange is the multiple of 2, 2, 4. When the students are um, waiting for their turtle, they're actually mentally thinking about what they have to do. And then they're also looking at the other turtle that's going around. So when it hits their turn, that's why sometimes they'll stumble and they'll not know where um, the, the next number is supposed to be because they're already trying to think of the other side. And that is good. Working memory to be able to have a different type of multitask going on is, is healthy for them. Four, Orange is the multiple of two, 12, two, six, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen. Twenty. Yellow is the multiple of four, four, eight, four, eight, twelve, sixteen, twenty, twenty-four. Yellow is the multiple of four, four, eight, twelve, sixteen, twenty, twenty-four, twenty-eight, thirty-two. Very nicely done. I've been here for 12 years, and I've seen a lot of incidents and um, unfortunate happenings with their families. And I do know our culture is a very, um, it's an inner city setting. They're exposed to drugs and violence. But there's one thing that these kids have is resilience, and they have the eagerness to learn. I'm finding, because of the chronic stress that they experience, their brains can't function as, 
as I would expect them to. So we work with Brain Gym. We work with, um, in our community, Ant Minerva, which is another type of um, mental, logical thinking. Um, the Turtles, which is recall. The skills that they need to do two or three or four step problems, especially with mathematics. For a warm-up activity, Cindy directs the students to work together in their collaborative groups to solve a timed problem. Write your numerical expression, solve the expression, box your answer, pin your paper on the blackboard. Are there any questions? So something like what we just did. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Nicely yeah. done. Yeah. Team three, you're rocking. What's just going on here? One-fifth times three. No. And then multiply by yeah. three. Nicely done. Make sure you have a numerical expression. Do do. Oh, I so I don't see it on here. I know because you I need to see it on there. Are you writing out the answer too? Yes. The difference between cool. I'll take it. What should you do next? In the next activity, Cindy gets buy-in by having the groups compete against each other for a reward. You must say the expression, explain what it says, solve the expression, and say the answer. The, the team that has all of them gets my smarties. Okay? Now, it's a talker, so you need to make sure you're talking with your group. This is not something you can solve in your head and tell each team member what to do. Now, just to make sure, just to make sure, when you say the expression, you have got to be able to use it because what you're going to see is word form. So you need to make sure that you are saying the expression. When you are explaining it, you need to tell me or tell the class what it's telling you to do, what it's explaining for you to do. Then you are to solve the equation and say the answer. Now, this is the, kick, this is the clicker. One person says one. The other person says one, the next person says one, and you say one. So all four team members have to say it. So when you stand up... I try to give them positive reinforcement right off the bat. Because of the chronic stress that they experience, they can come in with a negative um, outlook. And as soon as you start pumping positive, there's there's no other way but positive to come out so that's what we try to do that's what i try to do i think the first thing for building attitudes is role model kids need to see what a great attitude looks like sounds like so as a teacher if somebody gives you bad news and you go ah you know and you go in a big fit over it and kids go oh that's what you do you react instead of what kids really need is they need somebody that says oh i wasn't expecting this we can make this work that's a good attitude. Thank you, Sine, because I know you are a good person to be involved. <laughs> this is one group. This is one group. This is one group. There you go. Correct. That's what Elijah's trying to say. The last word. Right, so you have to have that as part of your equation, right? Because you're using what are you doing? Right? Number four. Team three was first. Team one was second, so we'll take three and one first. So everybody sit down. I find that um, in the past, I used to think the attitudes were something that they could change, something that they um, need to do when, before they come inside my, my door. But after, um, after reading um, Eric Jensen's book, I found that a lot of the attitude is me. Three times 15 and two times four. And what does the and mean? The, the next one. Okay, but what does and mean? Because if I write and in here, no. that's not a numerical expression. What am I writing in there? So once I started recognizing to change how I look at my students now and knowing that even though my expectations are high, I try to find a different avenue to reach that expectation. Addition. Yes. And finish? Um, three. I mean, four times two. Okay, do I need anything else in there? Somebody else help them. Do I need anything in there, Elijah? What do I need? 
I mean, don't give the wrong answer. A. What's the answer? 53. Is he correct? Yes. Team three, you are correct. Nicely done. Smarties for you. I'm going to. When I read Eric Jensen's book, um, I actually felt confident with what I was reading. You know, I was going, oh, I do that. And then I got to a chapter where it was two different teachers, and one teacher was saying, there's so much on our plate, and these kids aren't learning what they're supposed to do, and their attitudes are doing this and this. And I thought to myself, ooh. And then I read the other teacher, and this teacher was more engaging and recognizing that, well, my students are, are feeling good about themselves. Now, I hate to admit it, but I, on many occasions, was the first teacher. And so after reading that, um, I actually underlined it and wrote on there, this could have been me today. We need to understand where they're coming from. And that's where I take Eric Jensen's book to heart. Because from now on, I will make sure I understand their state of mind. But I think what really makes me a good teacher are my students. So that's, that's exciting for me, and that's what I'll take from it. Georgetown Elementary will continue to build on the progress they've made engaging students and building relationships. I think in education there's always things you want to improve upon because you're in a proactive mindset and you're looking at always, okay, what now? We've made this goal, what now can we do? And we really work a lot at knowing what our students need, but also knowing what our staff needs and understanding that we all have a piece of this pie and we all have to own it. And I think that's a big thing for us. So really just continuing to grow and reflect and you know, build our students to be the best that they can be. Blackburn Elementary. This Title I elementary school is about 900 miles south of Annapolis in Palmetto, Florida. Like Georgetown East, the students at Blackburn are confronted with considerable challenges on a daily basis. They're facing many, many different things that honestly, a lot of us can't even understand. Some of them go home and they had their last meal when they ate lunch with us, and they're not gonna have another meal until they get back and they have breakfast. Some of them go home to an empty house, and you know, some of our upper elementary kids are taking care of their younger siblings. Some of them go home to dysfunctional families where they have things that they have to do there that sometimes it's hard for us as adults to understand what their life is like at home. And so that's part of what we've had to do is open up and understand that our kids are facing many things that they bring to school. And when they get to school, the way they bring it is often different from student to student. Today is a Professional Learning Wednesday and our district's topic today is rigor. Okay, so here's our agenda today. The first thing, let's look at the outcomes first. We're going to dis discuss and define um, rigorous instruction, and we already have our own definition for it. We're, we decided we were using Barbara Blackburn's definition, but we're going to look at we're going to look at some. Um, another article that has some other stuff in it about rigorous instruction. So that's the part of what we're, that's the first thing we're gonna do. Then like the leadership the at Georgetown first, East, so Kathy has worked to incorporate Eric Jensen's engagement strategies on a school-wide basis. This includes regular professional development using engaging students with poverty in mind. We're going to take Eric Jensen's engagement strategies and we're going to continue to work collaboratively in our grade level teams to come up with the different ways that we can take our instruction up to the next level. A core understanding about getting the miracles to happen at your school is that you're not in this by yourself. The only way you have a chance to succeed at this is collaboration, and it's cooperation, and it's building a trusting environment. I've been to schools where we see that, and it's almost reliable, almost guaranteed that you will see 
good results academically. Kids see teachers that have each other's backs. They work with teachers they can trust. So having that camaraderie doesn't guarantee it, but without it, you have almost no chance at all. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. Class, class, class. Yes, yes. 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 How about class, class? Yes, yes, yes. 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 Do you, do you see yourself like having to think in a little different way about what I'm saying to be able to say that back? Take a second and talk to your team and think about at your grade level, how could you do that where you say something to them and then based on what you say, they have to say it back to you in a different way? Take two minutes. <laughs> I started here at Blackburn as a counselor seven years ago and caught onto one of his books and thought it was just great stuff for, for our school. Eric Jensen was doing workshops around the country. 13 of us actually went to one of his workshops. And while we were at that workshop, we started to recognize he's talking about our kids. And so that's when we started to really incorporate the kinds of things that we're doing at Blackburn now. I think that our teachers have a clearer understanding of where our students are coming from before they, they recognize that our students came from challenging home lives. But actually having the research behind why our students do what they do or why their brains are the way they are, uh, they, they can tailor their instruction better. So I see our teachers instructing more to our students rather than just to a general student. Blackburn builds school culture and encourages positive attitudes through the fish philosophy, inspired by the positive attitude of workers at the Seattle fish market. The fish philosophy is all about the kids being able to choose their attitude, about having fun, about working hard every day. There's four parts to it. It's be there, um, make their day, choose your attitude, and play. And so all of those components we've kind of encompassed around our whole school. At the beginning of every year, our teachers spend two months going through lessons that come from the FISH program. And within those lessons, they are working on strategies to set the tone for the classroom. The students actually get a say in how their classroom will run, how they will engage with each other, and how they choose to live their own daily lives. Uh, so all of the activities that they do match perfectly with what Eric Jensen has taught us as well. And they love that. They'll even say, you have Every single one of us here is a really great teacher. And the reason that we're really great is because every day we come to school and we figure out how can we do this a little bit better. Oh, so they can Blackburn's third grade teachers, Kayla Sarkozy, Katie Wilking, and Cindy Iverson, are collaborating on a lesson that engages students by using an in-depth, authentic project and role play. Put everything down that you can find about first class. Today you're gonna to see the students making inferences. Today was an introduction to them learning about the first class, second class, and third class of the passengers that were on Titanic. So we have put together a little activity where we have a suitcase or some type of trunk where they have different items in there that the passenger um, who would have been going on Titanic would have packed in their suitcase. We're gonna take them out one by one as the students use their background knowledge mixed with the text evidence, the evidence in front of them to kind of make inferences of who they thought that bag might have belonged to if they were sailing the Titanic. The activity developed from a prior lesson that involved relationship building. We did this a few months ago when we were doing inferencing and we each put together a bag that embodied ourselves, that represented each one of us and we, one by one, we didn't tell the students who the bag belonged to and so four days out of the week we did a bag and then the next day we did a different one. So they got to kind of guess who they thought that bag belonged to and we noticed that they were very engaged, like they loved doing it. Yes. Welcome aboard boys and girls. Are you ready to take a trip? Yes! Let's check out the Titanic. Let's look at this trunk. Let's go ahead and talk about what life was like back in, does anybody remember what year it was when the Titanic set sail? Hmm. Hmm. Do you remember? 1912. 1912. So things were the same or different back in 1912? Joseph, same or different? Different. Very different. And one big way, actually three big ways, that life was very, very different back then was we had 
three different classes. That's how people were grouped into three different classes. So we're going to jump up to the top of our... The thing I like about thematic teaching is it kind of lends itself to, you know, the students being able to kind of guide their own learning. We also like the idea of it being cross-subject. We can go mm -hmm. to different subjects and tie in science. Mm -hmm. We were doing solid, liquid, and gases, so we could bring that in. We can bring it into math. We can do a timeline. It can be mm -hmm. history. So it's not just reading. It mm -hmm. crosses right. over. That's really appealing. Yeah. Readers use to make inferences. So we're going to use the evidence that we read today, that we look at today, and that we listen to today to make some inferences about the three different classes of people. So I have two names written up here. Read the first one for me. Aureli, Mr. Mr. Henry Rogers. Good, Mr. Henry Rogers. Okay. I think about half of my kids come from migrant farm worker status. Mm, I have about eight out of 18 that are English language learners, very low socioeconomic group. Um, I think that they've dealt with a lot of things that we have can't even imagine and haven't even seen. So mm -hmm. this is their stability. This is mm -hmm. their, this is their consistency. This is their structure. Remember we talked a little bit about classes yesterday. What can you tell me about first class people, how were they grouped? Because everything that people did back then had to do with their class, their job, where they rode on a big ship or on a bus. What can you tell me about first class? Josie? They had a lot of money. They had a lot of money. What else? And they had really, really nice rooms. They had really, really nice rooms. Okay, you sound like you knew about first class. Mm -hmm. How about second class? Do you remember what we talked about just a little bit? They have a little bit of money, and they have nice, like, rooms. Okay, they have a little bit of money, they have nice rooms. Do you remember an example of someone's occupation in second class? Um, what teacher. job teacher. might they have? A teacher might be in second class. So someone very famous and rich might be in first class. Let's go to third class. Tell me a little bit about third class. What can we say? Destiny? They don't have any money. They don't have any money. Their pockets might be a little bit empty. But what else? They're poor. They're poor. Mm -hmm. Hard workers? Yeah. Probably, but they're poor. So we have the three different classes. In my opinion, the number one thing for behavior is relationship building. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a relationship, then they you don't mean, really. I mean, that's mm -hmm. the buy-in, that's the foundation, that's, that's everything. They want to work for you and they want to please you. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. as long as they know you and they feel like they're working for you and they're doing something together, then right. that helps a lot. So many of our children come without getting a lot of attention at home. Mm -hmm. So they're looking for any mm -hmm. attention, negative, positive. Mm -hmm. So I think, in fact, I know all of us really try to focus on the positive mm -hmm. and not ignore the negative, but not give it that much attention. Now, like I said, all of your luggage has been delivered. We're ready to set sail. Mm -hmm. This one showed up this morning. Mm -hmm. No name. I have no idea who it belongs to. What can you tell me about it just by looking at it? It's Let's really just make fancy. an observation. Sabrina? It's really fancy. It's really fancy. Like and it looks like they've shower. maybe done a little bit of traveling. Yeah, that's what I was gonna a say. lot of traveling. What were you going to say? I was going to say they were going to like they went to different places. They went to different places. What else can we say, Lily? They were in the first class. You're making that inference already just by looking at the outside of it. Lily thinks it's in first class already. Yeah. Okay. I think it's in first class because it looks like they were like in Paris and London because it, it says it's all Paris. the words and I think they really like London and Paris. Okay. Well, you're all on the you're all on a really good course, just like the Titanic was. I think it was in first class because these are like all the fancy places. Okay, so we don't even really need to open it, do we? Mm -hmm. We will. <laughs> are you ready? Yes. yes. Can you help me? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. <gasps> Okay, back up. We're going to take things out. Awesome. Back up and have a seat. Everybody's going to see everything. <laughs> Promise. 
I want the necklace. You know what? I'm going right for the jewelry too. <laughs> That's yours. Sure. What do we have? I have one just like this. You mean I got promoted to first class, maybe? That's so pretty. Fancy, plain, or medium? Fancy. Fancy. Very, very fancy. Oh my goodness. Do you remember what we called this? In Kayla's class, students make inferences about the suitcase in a turn and talk. Fancy is so awesome. Like, if it's on, um, like, second class, it'll be, like, oh, like, kind of old. Yeah, yeah. Like, if it was third class, it wouldn't be like that. All right, boys and girls, let's come back together. So I heard a lot of good conversation. I want to... I want to tell you all the two things that I heard the most. And one of them, I wasn't even really thinking. The first one that I was thinking was, this isn't super fancy, but it's also not raggedy. It just looks kind of in the middle, like a normal suitcase. But then when I heard some people say, they were commenting on the size of it. And they were saying, I don't think that's first class because look at how many belongings you could fit in here. Not a lot. All right. So here are a few items that are in this suitcase. As you see these items, I want you to have lots of thinking going on in your head, but I don't want you to share it just yet. All right. So these look like a pair of male pants. They don't look brand new. They look a little bit worn. No holes. Here's the first thing. No. Oh my. So raise raise your hand and tell me what you think. What well you know what these are, but what are they, Gabriel? Overalls. They're overalls. So I want you to turn and talk to the person next to you what these look like. What type passenger do you think this is? And I don't think it would be first class. Yeah, first class class has um, like fancy and jewelry all over. Like, yeah. So you don't think that it's first class, but so what class do you think that it is? I think it's either third or second. Third or second? Yeah, because it's not open. It's not that big. Once the contents of the suitcase are revealed, the teachers use a reading and writing task to spur deeper understanding. Students work together in groups based on the social class they were assigned. We really want to see them making connections with things that they've read. So all the different texts that we've read, we want to see them putting that together. How's my third class doing? Everything was new, new. Our cabin was just like a big hotel room. It was so big, the dining room was beautiful. The line is all the bright, polished silver you can imagine. So Survivor Ruth Be Becker, she's a 12-year-old, 12 12-year-old, 12 12 second, second class, class pass. And this one's okay. a first class. This is a first class passenger. It doesn't say any third class passenger survived. It says my hmm. pretty little cat. Maybe you were right. With its About electric the third class heater and pink. Yeah, yeah I don't think any survived. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. Well, I, think it, I think they didn't survive because they're like on the bottom since mm -hmm. they it, the boat was like in the water mm -hmm. and it went down. I think they're the first one because they're in the bottom. Not every lesson can be a dog and pony show, but when you throw those in right. a couple times a week, yeah. the students never know what's coming. So it's kind of, what are we going to do today? When they're engaged in what they're doing too, they get a lot more motivated. Okay. I think showing them their progress too. You know, you set goals, but along the way, like, you know, you haven't got there yet, but you have made this much growth is really important for them. Because then that kind of gives them that push of, okay, you know, I, I'm working towards it. I need to keep going because obviously what I'm doing is working. We are going. You think this is third class? At Blackburn, every teacher works to engage students. Even physical education teacher Austin Cleveland finds opportunities to build relationships and cognitive capacity. Studies show that after exercise, students are really open to learning. And that's what we do in PE. We're, we're exercising, we're checking our heart rate, we're making sure we're exercising, and we're having a lot, a lot of fun as well. But 
you know, that gives them the opportunity to learn a little bit more because we are exercising quite a bit. What does my body do when I get good exercise? Get I get sweaty. What else happens to my heart? Madison. My heart changes, doesn't it? What does it do? It goes faster, good. Good, so today when we use the scooter boards, our goal is to make sure that we get nice and sweaty and our heart rate goes up, right? Here's how we do it. The first thing that you gotta remember about this game. On your mark. The book has really helped me in a couple of ways. Um, one is that there's a part of the book that talks about neurogenesis. That's huge. Exercise can help neurogenesis. That's important. And the second thing I think is the positive to negative comments. You know, three positive comments for every one negative comment. Freeze! Check your heart rate. Remember, two fingers on our what? Neck, not our heart. We don't actually try to check our heart, we check our pulse right here in our neck. Give me a thumbs up if your heart rate is up. Give me a thumbs in the middle if you, if you think you can exercise a little bit harder. All right. It's pretty good. Check your heart rate. Two fingers on the neck. Give me a thumbs up if it's up. Give me a thumbs in the middle if you think you can exercise just a little bit harder. I love the honesty. Look at the honesty here, people. We're not saying that we're the best, we're saying we can try a little harder, right? Game on. Focus on the positive. Even the ones that are always doing the right thing, there are some things that they can always fix as well, so that's important too. Listen carefully. We did an excellent job today. Thank you for doing such a great job. When I call you Every teacher also incorporates working memory activities into their instruction on a daily basis. I, I We know that if we can take those little working memory games that have some kind of content hooked to them and hook it to some kind of movement activity or some kind of audio something, we know that that's going to even exponentially help our kids with their working memory. Ever since we've been studying Eric Jensen's work, we have been doing memory games every day. It comes towards the end of the year now that I don't even have to tell them to turn and talk into a memory game. If I have, if I get interrupted, they just turn and talk with their partners and they choose one of their favorite memory games to do. So boys and girls, we try to do memory games every day. Sometimes before lunch is usually our time. Sometimes we have to do them because I need to answer the phone or someone comes in our room. And you guys know to just quickly do a memory game instead of just wasting time and sitting there. Why do we even do these memory games? Why do we do these memory games? To make our brain bigger. Oh, it helps our brain get bigger? Very Why else good. do we do them, Chloe? It helps us with our memory. It helps you with your memory? Yeah. Nicholas? It helps us grow brain cells. Oh, it helps you grow your brain cells? <laughs> it helps you remember stuff. It does help you remember some things, and the more we've been practicing, we've noticed that our memory gets better and better. Just like when we play these games, even our number game, we used to only get to a couple numbers. Now it just keeps going and going and going and going, and you could do so many. Here, Amy's students demonstrate the working memory games they've been playing throughout the year. See how far we can get. All right, turn and talk. Eight, nine, five, six, seven, and one. Wow, I heard some of you getting very, very far. And I loved when you noticed that you couldn't remember your partner was so respectful and you just did a quiet womp, womp, womp. And then you started over. And then you got further and further and further with your memory game. How about this? We are gonna play the rhythm game. All right, 
Let me see some rhythms. I definitely think that at any time that we just need a little brain break just to kind of stand up and, and do one of the memory games. If you just have even a couple minutes to get up and get their bodies moving and get their focus back. All right, let's massage our brain real quick because we're about to do a really hard memory game. All right, you ready for get, you ready to get your brains ready? Yes. We are gonna do our sentence yes. memory game. All right, I can't wait to hear some really good sentences. Okay. Turn and talk. Hi. Zebra. Okay, so zebras. Zebras eat. I have a robot. Zebras eat. I have a robot. Zebras eat. Strawberries. Period. I think the biggest thing is they think of it as a game, but I'm adding in content so that not only are we kind of playing a game, but we're also learning at the same time. They might not know it, but they're having fun while they're, while they're doing it. Awesome I job. Awesome job, and I love that I heard you guys were those people could use it. One huge thing that we're seeing happen across our classrooms is that our kids are starting to really set their own goals and then they're really looking at where are they in relationship to those goals. And we've done that a lot in the area of literacy, in the area of reading. What we really wanna do is expand that to other content areas just to make it a little bit bigger. Oh, wow. Now, are we where we wanna be? No, we're absolutely not. But are we on our way? We absolutely positively are. And that's the thing that's really exciting for our school. The human brain is designed to be able to be responsive to the environments we live in. If you want kids to be different, the environment's got to be different. If they show up at school and they immediately feel camaraderie, if they love being in their class, if the team is good, if they feel the material's relevant, if they love the goals they have, like gaudy, amazing goals, and they're engaged, suddenly their experience is different. So then their brain adapts and becomes different. You say, I'm gonna be the teacher that the kids remember, and they remember for a good reason. They remember who they became during that time with me. You can be that teacher. Why? Brains can change, and that means not just your kids, but it means you can change too. Okay, well that was powerful and so much good stuff, um, no doubt. So let's move on to some takeaways from this as well and um, get back on to the learning track of learning about engaging students. Now, um, let's just talk a, a moment on some volunteers that would like to give some of their takeaways from, from this illustration. Any volunteers? A couple of takeaways? New things that you can incorporate in your classroom? I just wanted to add, I think the adding the, uh, the three positives to the one negative is just um, a great idea. Isn't that a great idea? Yeah, it's a great um, idea. You know, in a world that, you know, as I said, we're bombarded by negativity in mood and even in the news, um, in the household, we don't know what kids are, you know, being exposed to. And so, I mean, that's an easy classroom rule, you know, if three positives over one negative, just to be able to add that in. Thanks for sharing, yeah. Michelle. Sure. I said, well, that's what I put down to the one, you know, if there's a negative and three positive. Uh -huh. And I have the um, working memory game and the rhythm game. Right. And the rigor. I've really seen the rigor is the key to 
active learning, you know, you see the kids actually, um, you know, being more engaged. And you, it's really true. You do see it in the students, you know, if they're, you know, feeling, you know, am I just being talked to? And we do as teachers don't see that they do have feelings. And then we just think about objectives and goals and assessments. And we don't step back down to see, you know, maybe, you know, they, they went through something at home. And, um, but once they do gain your trust is another story as a teacher, because then, you know, as a teacher, we're told to report, you know, anything and then, you know, do a scan. So, you know, that's another thing you got to be very careful too about being a teacher. Um, I have encountered some of that in the previous years because they trust you and they open up to you. And at the same time with the DIE, you have to do a scan and then, you know, that's to help them. But, you know, in a way you're, you feel like, I don't know how they're going to feel towards you, but, you know, but um, I did write down three things. Very nice. Thank you so much for sharing those. Um, I, I agree with you on those, um, specifically that buy-in in a world of mistrust and, um, you know, lack of coping skills. I think the first thing for young kids is to find ways to be able to attract, to trust adults and others. It seems to be um, the social structure, of course, has has changed, you know, and, you know, at the very beginning of um, this particular video, we saw the the um, the teachers out front greeting the students as they're entering and they're shaking hands and, you know, even a hug. I mean, I was like, uh oh, can you real can you still hug a student? You know, it's so many things that we typically do as the nurturing factor in the classroom. But um, now there's so many things that do block um, what we're used to just that that human part of engagement. So um, thank you so much for sharing that, Christine. I agree with with you on those as well. Um, any other suggestions? Joanne, how about hearing from you at all? Good morning. Good morning. I was kind of taking notes along the way, some of the stuff that jumped out at me. Uh -huh. um, I know that he mentioned that engagement is very important. And positive feedback, that's positive. Uh, providing a positive culture and a good way to do that is with a smile. Even when the children see you smiling, they know that that they're safe and that, you know, that they can, you know, they know that they can trust the teacher, that they can work with the teacher. Um, role modeling is very important. You know, they watch you, they watch your attitude. And then from that, that's how they know what that, that from just from seeing you, they learn from you. You know, even when you come into class and you know you're not ready, they know you're not ready and they, they can play on that also. Um, then another one was uh, environment is important. You know, it leads to experience. It changes the experience of the student and they remember who they become when you are teaching them. So. You know, we have a lot of impact on the children that come into our classroom or the children that we come into contact with. Yeah, absolutely. As you were saying, those visual cues, um, the students, they are aware of those, you know, they're, they're looking for differences, they're looking for um, the meaning of that, what, how is this different from what I'm getting at home, perhaps, you know, looking at those areas as well. So you're absolutely right with um, their awareness is incredible and um, creating that positive environment and uh, making sure that we're building real strong positive attitudes. Very important. Thank you for that. Um, how about um, anyone else? Mark, um, Ms. Johnson, some takeaways? Routines. I mean, you saw a lot of routines mm -hmm. and uh, I, I mean, it seemed like these videos were all recorded like later in the school year too. Mm -hmm. um, so it showed, I mean, what they were doing, they'd probably been doing all year. Uh, 
and the kids were used to it, which is all good. Um, you know, the, you saw the trust in the classroom among the kids. I saw the trust. Right. Um, yeah, routines. I've always been one for uniforms in a way. So I like that first school. Yeah, I mean, even though, you know, they say it was low income in Georgetown, but come on. I mean, yeah. our kids would love to have that school right now, you know, that wow. they were in. Um, so, yeah, I'm all about, you know, uniformity in a way. Absolutely. It, um, it creates a sense of bonding, actually, instead of um, separating, you know, you can sometimes use that as um, a class issue when if, if students that might be, you know, of a higher um, economical, you know, status in their home, you know, and they're coming in with a certain types of clothes or whatever, those, those things do matter. Um, I remember even as a child when we were, um, you know, when I was in elementary school and there was a struck a strict dress code back in the day of, um, you know, yeah, strict dress code. You couldn't wear jeans, you, certain things. You couldn't wear shorts. You know, there were that dress code. And I remember um, as a child then going into maybe middle school or what something like that, and there was no longer a dress code. And I remember perfectly this thing of, it seemed to be a lot of, unrest in the school. Students were not as respectful. And um, I always go back and I do equate that with the dress code. So um, I believe that, that that sets the tone for the classroom in a lot of different areas. And it kind of puts the student on equal ground. So thank you so much for that, Mark. Um, how about um, Pearl, any comments from you on your end? I'd love to hear from you as well. Good morning. Good morning. Yes. Um, I like the way she said pump positive and then you get positive. Mm, yes. Uh, you know, um, and then the, you know, the, where the teacher, one of the teacher while she was talking, she said, um, it's a lot of attitude in me, you know, like, you know, she, you know, she thought it was the kids and then she reflected on herself, you know, right. Um, you know, um, the way I got it was, um, you know, as a teacher, you have to um, um, put that positive in, in order for the children to, you know, to feel the same way, you know, they can feed off of that, feed off of you. You know, that's, that's, I thought that was very good. And um, I like the game that they were playing on, but I kind of, you know, thought about my, you know, the little kids, the preschoolers, um, you know, like giving them, you know, what I put here is, you know, like um, if you give them something brown and then they say brown and then they, in a sentence, they would put, this is a brown bear. Right. You know, that's what, you know, I thought, you know, we could try that um, during circle time when we come back to class. So yeah. I thought that was good. Yeah, very good. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, some of the uh, other in incredible ideas that um, that you know that I focus on, and I just completely agree with is you know being able to encourage hope back into our students. You know, and um, re re. Um, reiterating that as much as possible to be able to provide a place of the classroom for hope, um, keeping, keeping in mind that we are learning about coping skills. Um, also creating um, that connection between the student and the child and even in the group activities. I really enjoy that of, um, just like Mark, you said, it was probably in, you know, closer to the end of the, the school year, but um, that's a good place for us to start because these are things that we can bring into the next semester, new semester. And um, using teaching as um, the idea of we are truly 
difference makers. When we see ourselves that way and changing our attitudes that we are truly difference makers. We are expanding opportunities, imagination, goals, and experiences for our children as well. Um, also, um, remembering to energize the students. I love that as far as how the, how the students became used to quickly getting in their groups if the teacher was on another task or disrupted that um, they were already in the process of being able to get into these groups. So as we move forward into implementing these, these are great opportunities to start at the beginning or now in engaging in those types of exercises, whether it's with numbers, with um, letters, with colors, or, you know, and then growing into the sentences. So this is definitely a scaffolding type of activity that we can bring back. Um, I love the five things being ready for learning. I love that when um, that was kind of one of those cues to give students, okay, what are the five, are you doing the five things to be ready for learning? That's another quick exercise that we can start implementing into the class. Um, of course, the turtle and using that that information was 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 wonderful. So um, I I love being able to to use these areas um, and techniques to bring into the classroom. So moving right ahead, um, we'll get Michelle a little bit more involved in us. We're going to quickly run through um, more of um, some of the, the timing pra um, practices of what we can actually bring into the classroom, specifically utilizing our coping skills. So uh, Michelle, can you um, I'll welcome you back. And again, we're looking specifically on level three and five, um, you know, the, that grade level. Can you share some of this of um, what we're what we're looking to do? Sure. Well, good morning, everyone. And we'll um, I'll read over this with for you. Um, uh, three to five elementary levels. Lesson three coping skills. Um, students will learn techniques for managing stress, stress sorry, and conflict. Um, students will identify various sources that influence an individual's mental, emotional, and social health behaviors. Students will demonstrate effective verbal and nonverbal communication skills to enhance health. And students will demonstrate nonviolent strategies to manage or resolve conflicts. And finally, the students will engage in focused conversations about grade appropriate topics and texts, build on ideas of others, pose specific questions, respond to clarifying thinking and express new thoughts. Okay, thank you so much for that. Yeah, so that's pretty much the goals here. So these are the simple objectives that we will go over. Um, we're hoping that students will be able to understand what stress is and identify its effects in their lives. I mean, this is something that is a reality and we need to be aware of bringing skills so they can cope a little, a little better. Um, also, students will be able to identify techniques and strategies in order to cope with stress-inducing situations. That's it for today. Thank you so much for joining us. Until the next time, it's Dr. Kim Eagles and Michelle Bell with Global Ed. See you next time. Bye-bye.